Good evening, friends. I Hoymonti Bakchi from www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Welcome you this evening for a discussion on a book. Her stories, uh, in sorry, <laughs> sorry, ma'am. Uh, Indian women down the ages. I'm privileged to be in the company of the author Deepi Priya Mehrotra. Tell me your story. Dot biz calls for registration for the writing program season six in association with Rupa Publications. To participate in this writing workshop, you must register by fifteenth of May. Let me begin with introducing the author, Dr. Deepi Priya Mehrotra. Deepi Ma'am is a storyteller. and a social scientist her creative non fiction includes the defi definitive biography of peace activist iram sharmila pioneering research into single mothers lives a social history of notanki theater and its star actor gulab bai she has taught gender studies political science philosophy and research methods at delhi and other universities her roots go deep into feminist and democratic rights movements she has been published by penguin rupa rotelage sage and zuban deepi ma'am also writes in hindi welcome ma'am it's such a pleasure to have you here Welcome, ma'am. Yeah, can you can you see me and hear me? My connection yeah. seems to be coming and going. Yeah, hi, hi. That's okay. Yes, okay, I can see fine. you, ma'am. Good, good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, to begin with, how did you come across this idea of writing about these powerful women in Indian history who have not really been talked about in our academic history books? Yeah. that's right hemanti um so history is really a place for stories about ourselves our ancestors but i noticed that the stories being told were mostly about the actions of men women were in the margins stray wives or daughters kind of lurking in the shadows i wanted to explore and shine a light on these figures so the seeds of the idea of this book was there in my mind since a long time and of course i would say that the motivation is rooted in the present in the ground reality of women being so marginalized today too as we know them you know women are incredibly strong often quite diverse multifaceted but very little of that gets acknowledged in either public domains or private domains instead we are routinely the butt of um uh, stereotypes derogatory humor you know talking down rampant kind of invisibilization so there's a gap in our perceptions huge blind spots in our ways of looking and this book was an is an attempt to start filling those gaps you know from what one person can do i'm trying to do and there are many others there is a body of feminist scholarship which works to correct this kind of androcentric bias to challenge the limited perspective and to create new standards you know inclusive standards so uh i i would just also add that my previous writing has been driven by feminist convictions and um i've been working more in the contemporary earlier so there's a book on gulab bai the traveling theater kind of superstar and a, a book about iram sharmila uh and human rights peace movements in manipur and so on so the pre the present book was kind of waiting to be written you know a compendium of women's life stories going far back into the past many different women and finally i wrote it because it is so completely interesting 
you know it is so fascinating to see these characters come alive they were not just victims they were makers of history yeah and of literature makers of philosophy of art architecture music religion so the joy in writing has been discovering these unique stories absolutely ma'am it was really yeah. a very new thing uh, for the readers it will be really appreciated um you have presented the stories of women uh, from the second millennium bc to the mid 19th yeah. century india all these women seem to be somewhere forgotten in the mainstream documentation please tell us about yeah. the research that went into the making of this book yeah that's such a good question you know it took me so much longer than we had initially assumed although over the years you know over the decades i would say i have kept kind of uh, you know squirreling away interesting material wherever i found it on uh, little known but clearly fascinating women who were victims as we are saying of this kind of collective amnesia so as i began you know with a focus researching for this book it seemed as if entire new worlds were op opening up you know i had to go from one item of uh, evidence to another to another to try and locate something more and uh, to to you know look at the times also because i do believe that whatever one writes when it is non fiction then it should be true to the facts i think that's very important it's different if it's fiction but this is non fiction and um, so the facts are really very important so i had to understand not only the women in isolation at all but the times which means a very huge span of indian history uh, human history so uh, i accessed actually dozens of books by the end of it and uh, largely secondary sources some primary sources such as for instance you know the historian gulbadan her history uh, uh, written in um, uh, 16th century uh, uh, so so these are available but we don't tend to read them they're very interesting um, then there were you know articles Because there was a chapter in a book, maybe maybe a reference on a website or a blog that I kept following through. Mm, sometimes um, you find that there is um, folklore, legend, um, just a fragment somewhere, or a hagiography. You know, so one has to delve into the available sources. to reconstruct the lives sometimes you know remove what what is not so great the chaff and keep the grain so the most evocative sources i have to say himanti were the writings of the women themselves so often this is poetry and the poetry is sprinkled with autobiographical minutia so speaking of emotions speaking of mundane things speaking of rich inner life speaking of multi layered journeys revealing some of the situation and of course the people around them at the times so uh, you know the writing itself was of course going alongside the research um, and um, i would say that there were some gaps in the evidence still because historical sources are inevitably limited so i worked from whatever i had and these are short profiles and i need some Sometimes they have, each of them is actually quite uh, um, uh, quite dense in a way because it has a lot packed within a few. That was also a bit of a challenge, you know, to in to each document, legend, to arrive at the most plausible truth. um so remaining true to evidence but through imagination through a kind of empathy because historians will always exercise some amount of you know imagination um uh, so so their facts kind of grow wings and the characters tend to come alive then so i found that forgotten figures were taking shape and history was taking on new contours so it became more and more interesting as i went on 
And I found uh, many of these ladies, um, uh, I would call them our foremothers in a way, they emerge as very gutsy, often startling in their originality, independence, the talents, what they contributed. They're not cardboard figures, and I have not tried to fit them into any kind of formula. Uh, one tries to understand the person as she was. You know, she may have lived hundreds, thousands of years ago. But uh, you kind of put yourself in her skin, in her context. So, so I would dream about them, you know, I would dream about them and examine her words and deeds as much as we know to understand what would have formed her, her challenges, her emotional, mental makeup. And um, so it was in all extremely challenging. And um, I would say that some sources I could mention which were very useful. For instance, um, I have a number of life sketches of Buddhist women from very early on, you know, 2,500 years ago, um, many of them, and a number of these life sketches. Now, where did I get these? You know, 2,500 years ago is no joke. So there is a book called the Theri Gatha, which is a collection of poems or songs by Buddhist bhikkhunis, Buddhist nuns. Uh, at the time of the Buddha and a little later. So it is the Theri Gatha that actually provided the main source for these women's lives. And uh, there are brief life sketches in, in Buddhist sources, but it is the words of the women themselves, which I will share with you a little bit uh, during this hopefully interview. And um, similarly with um, you know the women poet mystics of medieval India, like Andal from Tamil Nadu, um, Karaikal Amiyar and Akka Mahadevi uh, from Karnataka, Lal Ded from Kashmir. Their poetry is not just there in books, it's alive, it is used, it is sung, it is quoted in the regions that they belong to. So Andal's poetry, and she was just a teenager when she died actually, but she wrote as a teenager, her songs are part of the Tamil wedding rituals, you know, and other things. So it is so very much in use and so on with each of the others. It's amazing. Janabai and Kanhopatra from Maharashtra as looked at, then Rami from Bengal, Mirabai we know, but sometimes I was looking at people who are known like Mirabai, but the perspective of presenting their lives was different. It was not the usual, patri you know, a male perspective or um, so. So it's it, so their life stories and their literary contributions are so diverse. They were rejecting religious and social orthodoxies and claiming legitimacy for their own direct con connect and living according to their own light. So uh, also, you know, there are other poets like Mudupalani who wrote an erotic epic, Molla who wrote a Ramayana, Mahalaka Bai Chanda who is arguably the first woman writer of Urdu Ghazals and uh, of course Gulbadan the historian. So these are women whose words are with us, you know, so we can reconstruct from there and whatever other evidence we have. Then, of course, when there are women warriors and freedom fighters and rebels, you find some mention in political historical writings. That's uh, so you go to those and you you know look up what you can, and um, and this is what I was doing, uh, like uh, Rudrama of Telangana, Durgavati of Gondwana, Abakka Rani Abakka of Tulu land, and so on. Velu Nachayar, Chinnamma of Kittur. Maharani Jind of Punjab, the Begums of Bhopal, and uh, many more. So, so the research took its own time. It was, um, I think, six or seven years after I began that the book has been published. Of course, I was not working throughout that time. I was for two years teaching full time and um, with, with a parent who was very aged. And so, um, yeah, so, so I was uh, only writing maybe one hour or two hours at night sometimes for at least that couple of years and doing other work. So, so, but it was a delight to come back to this at night. You know, it was just so interesting, always uncovering new facts. So. It was so interesting to and hear the story behind these stories. 
the hard work which you have put through it, it's really encouraging and inspiring um so uh, ma'am in your book uh, her stories indian women down the ages you talk about the ordinary women in all her splendid diversity multifaceted struggle and achievement we often see mm. that when we talk about powerful women we somewhere neglect the fact that they are as ordinary as any other woman on the contrary we can also say that uh, ordinary women with their daily life struggles and all of the toils they go through are continuously contributing something extraordinary what was your reason yeah. of portraying the ordinary side of women who did something yeah. extraordinary in their lives it will be nice if you share yeah. glimpses uh, from the book uh, the points sure very well put himanti so nicely what a good question so um, uh, so you know uh, there is this great men kind of writing of history which has been dominant and uh, which of course has been challenged by critical feminist subaltern scholarship and so on so a uh, dalit uh, scholarship so i did not want to replace the great men with a set of great women you know that's not um, a democratic inclusive history so rather it is the uh continuities with the lives of common women that is foregrounded in my writing so you do have the person standing out but you also see her connections the kind of embeddedness often in female friendships and solidarities in um maybe with mother daughter relationships maybe sisters maybe and of course there could be also cross gender relationships but the fact is that those uh those kinds of realities of women supporting each other is so downplayed and so ignored in patriarchal societies and in patriarchal history writing as well that um you know for instance when you look at the kinship ties that women have it is so different from the way it operates for men's lives you know as a generality women were moving from one home to another home from one re, you know place to another place maybe 100 200 300 kilometers away and at marriage and so they were part of two families and the kinship ties means that the role that they play and of course the relationships that they have are far more complex you know and uh, so so this, this is the eye with which um, i was looking and this is true for you know actually the division between ordinary and extraordinary women is quite artificial um uh, it 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 really is um, selectively saying okay the public persona is uh, more important the private is ignored um but much of women's labor and contributions actually take place in the domestic sphere and these are equally relevant for sustaining human culture webs of relationships and if we have the eye to look then we take this seriously this is all dignified work that deserves respect and we cut away at stereotypical depictions so um and you said that can i uh, so that can i go to the book so i i look at two or three women and um, so there is kivi mata kivi so she's called mata kivi but um, in the sikh um, community um have you, you have much of the time done away in my writing with these uh, you know with the mata or the maharani etc so i'm calling her kivi here i meaning no disrespect at all but um, kivi institutionalized langar so i'm quoting here more or less from from my book uh, kivi the chapter on kivi she institutionalized langar Uh, a place of astonishing generosity and a unique contribution to human imagination of inclusive community food is offered at gurdwaras to date by the sikh congregation to anyone who comes by with no differentiation on basis of religion or race special langars are offered to feed refugees or victims of flood or other disasters or just you know poverty stricken people destitute so despite the langars flourishing worldwide very few people have heard of kiwi uh, if you go back to the 16th century the early years of the sikh religion langar began really with uh, sulakni and gurunanak so sulakni was gurunanak's wife 
and um, uh, we don't know that normally. Uh, so every, we all know Guru Nanak's name, but uh, very yeah. few of us have heard the name Sulakhani. But um, but so they had begun feeding some, you know, a bit of community kitchen. But Kibi, who came next, and she, who was younger, and she actually uh, institutionalized Langar. She, um, and uh, Langar was popularly known at that time as Mata Kivi Jida Langar. So Kivi systemized seva, that is voluntary service, as we know, in a kind of community kitchen, and took great care with the cooking and the serving of food. Uh, the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh holy book, it actually notes and mentions that Mata Kivi provided comfort to pilgrims, like a tree with deep leafy shade. She distributed rich fare such as kheer, which tasted like ambrosia. Meals were served with equal respect without distinction of caste, creed, or color. So even in the spread of the Sikh religion, we would um, uh, definitely, if we look with an inclusive eye, this also played a role. Uh, so and I'll, I'll go to another character, uh, quite different, almost the same time, however, um, 16th century, and this is Bega Begum. Now, again, I'll quote a little bit. So, Bega was a passionate, strong-willed woman who knew love and loss. She hailed from Bataksha, Afghanistan. She married Humayu at the age of 16. She was 16 years old. Uh, three years later, she became Empress of Hind after Babur died. She fulfilled the duties of Empress. She had a daughter, Akika. So there are many details which I'm not reading out. Um, less than a decade later, in 1539, women and children accompanied Humayu and the royal troops to the Battle of Chosa in Bengal. It was a, a war with Shesha Suri. Shesha Suri was the victor. Several Mughal women were lost, captured, or killed. Bega was captured by Shesha Suri. Her daughter, seven-year-old Akika, disappeared. Her daughter, seven-year-old Akika, disappeared. We will never know what Bega experienced as a prisoner of war. Abul Fazal, the official historian, claimed that she was treated honorably. Gulbatan somehow doesn't mention this. She, she, she mentions a lot more about Bega, but not about how she spent her time in captivity as a prisoner of war. So we're not sure how long she was with um, held captive, but at some point we know that she was sent back to the family, perhaps within a year or perhaps a little more than that, two or three years. And by then, of course, Humayu had lost the empire and the family lived in Kabul by and large. Um, uh, not Humayu, but the, most of the family lived in Kabul. Uh, so we know that Bega suffered abduction and captivity. Her little daughter met an unknown fate. Meanwhile, Humayu was uh, doing other things. So he was uh, moving around. He wanted to win back um, Hind. But um, so in his personal life, also there were, you know, there was stuff happening. So one of his wives, Gumar, Gumar Begum, uh, gave birth to a daughter, Bakshi Banu, about two years after the Battle of Chosa. And uh, we don't know whether Bega was back or what, but she probably wasn't back, you know. But, uh, and then we, but we also do know that Humayu married during this time a young girl, I think 12 or 13 years old, Hamida, and had a son by her, although Hamida and Humayu, with some of their troops, were just moving around the countryside, not at all in a good shape. But there was the son born, Akbar, and Bega lived amid the other women of the family. Uh, Hamida and, uh, and Hamida and Humayu had gone off for five years. They were in Persia. Uh, Akbar, little boy, was left with the family. So we have these little snippets from Gulbadan's history saying that um, 
Uh, so Gulbadan, to just fill you in on that, Gulbadan was Babur's daughter and uh, Humayun's sister. And she wrote a history which spanned her father Babur and Humayun and Akbar's reigns. So she lived uh, in up to her 80s. And uh, so, so Bega lived amid, at this point, amid the other women of the family in Kabul. And from Gulbadan, we know little touches that Bega Begum was knowledgeable in herbs and medicines. She cured baby Akbar's toothache with a healing paste. Now, Bega was Humayun's senior most queen. And despite travails and separations, it seems that they shared a bond of affection. Uh, Bega felt keenly the sharp edge of suffering. And we can only imagine what it might be to have co-wives and so on. But, um, uh, but she was reconciled to the inevitable. She was part of a spirited family and the women were doing a lot together. The harem actually is the place where women live and the children grow up. Um, unlike the misrepresentation of the harem as a place for sexual orgies, but Actually, the harem is just the place where women live and the children grow up. So it's a place full of activities. And um, they were going sometimes, the women too, were going sometimes to war. At other times, they were going for excursions, such as extended picnics are described, staying overnight at a picnic, enjoying feasts, um, uh, telling stories till late into the night visiting orange gardens it seems and so on so the women formed strong collectives even as co-wives we have evidence of women befriending each other though it would be many different emotions of course uh, bega was devastated by news of Humayun's sudden death in delhi's purana Kila, just shortly after he won back you know um, the country so uh, he died soon after that thereafter of course the whole family did go to, in, to, to Hind, to uh, most of the family, to Agra finally, Bega hewed her own path. Uh, she built Arab Sarai in Nizamuddin. Okay, so here's this woman in year 1560-61, she built Arab Sarai in Nizamuddin, a resting place for travelers. Uh, in 1564, she went on pilgrimage to Mecca. Three years she was there. She earned the epithet Haji Begum. She brought back Persian artisans and the architect Mirak Mirza Ghias, and she was the one to commission Humayu's tomb at her own cost. She chose the site beside the Yamuna. She supervised the project, its massive domes, the intricate inlay work, the charba with flower beds and fruit trees. Humayu's remains were then interred, reinterred in this stately monument, which towered over the city and still remains a conspicuous landmark. Next to this, Bega established a madarsa for girls. And that's where she lived. This is how she wanted to live. Akbar, her nephew, constantly entreated that Bega come and join the royal family in, in Agra. She preferred to live on her own, free of probably why? But probably because she she wanted to do these things, you know, to make this mausoleum, to uh, run a mother supper girls. Maybe she thought of Akika and she ran this mother supper girls. We can only imagine her motivations. But clearly we see she was an independent minded personality with a very complex and interesting life. She did things that contribute to our lives. I mean, Homayu's tomb is one of the you know nicest places in Delhi. Uh, and it, it was actually before the Taj Mahal, and the Taj Mahal actually took, learned a lot from the Humayun's tomb. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at perhaps one or two more uh, more women, if that's okay with you. Um, yes, yeah, sure, Okay, so the Buddhist bhikkhunis that I mentioned earlier, I'm quoting just a tiny poem by one of them. Her name was Mutta. Mutta, she came from Kosala and she became a nun. So these women usually chose to become nuns and we get a sense of what they were escaping uh, from this little poem. We also get a sense of what they were finding, you know. So she wrote this, so free am I, so gloriously free, 
free from three petty things, from mortar, from pestle, and from my hunchback lord. Freed from rebirth and death I am, and all that has held me down is hurled away. So you see this startlingly kind of contemporary poem, domestic violence, overwork, labor, um, and she, the, the uh, you know, unrecognized labor of the household, mortar and pestle, and the hunchback lord, and she chooses to leave all this, and she chooses to be in a space where she has more freedom to be by herself, to learn, to teach, to be in a different kind of community where there is not this kind of um, yeah, unrecognized and undignified labor and situations, so relationships perhaps. So, so uh, when um, similarly, when you see Lal Dev in Kashmir, uh, it was ill treatment in her marital household that prompted her to leave. And she was disillusioned with worldly life. And some, similar is the case with Akka Mahadevi, who also had suffered domestic violence. So, so if you look at Lal Dev in Kashmir and Akka Mahadevi in Karnataka, they both wandered the countryside. They refused. They, they didn't want to go back to any family life. They wandered. They didn't wear clothes. So this is very, very radical. Um, it's almost unimaginable. They didn't wear clothes. It was a challenge to patriarchal follies and pride and to, you know, what is it that you're looking at? What is important? What is not important? They faced fear. They overcame it. Humiliation, harassment. They lived with that. And their journeys were spiritual journeys as well. So practical and spiritual wisdom. And they became highly respected figures in their own lifetimes, held in high regard. They were, the part, they were part of the highest kind of spiritual um, congregations and debates, they, they were tested and um, Akama Devi was tested and found uh, really, you know, welcomed then amongst the scholars of the time. And um, uh, th that, of course, uh, you know, we, we know that that means the male scholars were established, but uh, the Jangamas, the, the way that these two lived their lives was a sharp critique of the norm, of normal domesticity, of conventional marriage and family systems, and they saw through it all. So, Something similar is true of many others, you know, under Karaika Lamayar, Ovia, Mirabai. I mean, it may not be domestic violence always, but they, they just sought through the futility and hypocrisy of so-called normal life, ordinary life. And they wanted a deeper life. They wanted something more real, genuine, authentic. So um, maybe this I'll wind up with Unia Cha. So here's a woman from Kerala and a martial arts exponent. She learned it in her family. Her father, brothers were all martial arts exponent and so was she. So here's a little story. When her mother-in-law, and there are ballads sung about this, so she's known in, in the area where she comes from. Uh, when her mother-in-law forbade her from going to a place notorious for ruffians, gangsters, Unyarcha insisted on going. She said, Born in the famous Puthuram family, fearless daughter of Kannappam, born with valor and courage, I can't stay back like a coward. She set off with her Urumi uh, a sword, a whip like sword, tied around her waist, and her husband Kunhiraman in tow. As they approached Nadapuram, she noticed how fearful he was, her husband, and she reproached him. Doesn't matter if thousands come to attack, I belong to Puthuram. Have you ever heard that women of Puthuram sent their men to be killed? She defeated the gangsters who surrounded them. They fell at her feet, offered her gifts of gold and jewelry. She, uh, you know, was not agreeing with any of this. She had captured them and she didn't want to release them. But finally, she agreed to pardon them on the condition that they would never again harass any woman. This was the condition she laid. And the chief promised, the chief of those gangsters. Later, returning home, Oniyarcha handed over that booty to her mother, that golden jewelry that had been gifted to her, to her mother-in-law. And she proudly announced that she had brought her husband, Kunhiraman, back unharmed. So, uh, to, to, you know, conclude this, there are... Uh, so many queens that I have looked at, there is, um, you know, Queen Dida, who had a disability, 
uh, there's Abaka of Tulu land, there's um, uh, the, the Jahanara, there's uh, um, uh, you know, these fighter queens, Durga, Durgavati and Rudrama and so on. Now, each of them also has her ordinary life going on. You always hear of the husband, the child, you hear many things that were going on there. For, for instance, Ahilya by Holkar, we know, after her husband died, her, she was to commit sati, because that's what happened. But her father-in-law appealed that she not commit sati, because he knew of her enormous capabilities. And uh, she, she actually... Uh, ruled as this brilliant queen, and we know that. And uh, the, the, the a little detail I want to share here is that her daughter, she had one daughter, Muktabai. When Muktabai's husband died, Muktabai insisted on committing sati, and she did. You know, she wouldn't hear what her, she wouldn't listen to her mother. So it's sad that sometimes when you see the extraordinary and the ordinary are collapsed together, or that there is you know, two steps forward, sometimes three steps backward by the next generation on some issues. So, but I do want to share one more person here. That is Queen Didda, uh, who reigned in Kashmir for nearly 50 years. And uh, so she, after the death of her son, uh, was the ruler in her own right. The death of her son and her three grandsons. Now, Didda had a physical disability. She was carried around by Valga, uh, a kind of maidservant companion. And the historian that is very well-known historian of Kashmir, who wrote the Rajatarangini, Kalhana, Kalhan, um, he has written that the lame queen, so he has called her the lame queen, whom no one had thought capable of stepping over a cow's footprint, got over a host of enemies just as Hanuman got over the ocean. Treacherous ministers who for 60 years had robbed 16 kings were, um, were laid to, uh, were, were um, quickly exterminated by the energy of Queen Dita. So I you know, wonder about the death of her son and grandsons. Was it caused by illness or accident? Some of the historians say she got them killed, but there is no evidence that she got them killed. So I would imagine rather that they died of natural causes, perhaps. I mean, there's, um, and she was devastated by feelings of sorrow and loss because she had no family. She constructed temples for them. The Abhimanyu was her son, Abhimanyu Pura town and Abhimanyu Swam temple. And in memory of Valga, her, her maidservant who would carry her, she built Valga Mutt and so on. There's also Diddipura town and Didamat in Srinagar and so on. Her coins carry the legend Sri Dida along with goddess Arodaksha, goddess of abundance. So her prime minister and army commander Tunga was much younger than her and they, he was rumored to be her lover, much younger. So this again was pure speculation because Himanti, you find this again and again that there is a linking up of women's names with uh, with men to to discredit yes. them rather than anything else. Yeah, and this happens in their own time, and the historians take it up. So, but this was pure speculation. But my comment on it is that even if it were a fact, then more power to her. Yeah. So. Yeah. And this, yeah, I could go on and on as you can see. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. One more question which comes to my mind right now is that if we, you know, Google that uh, 15, mm -hmm. about 15 historical figures uh, who were women in the Indian history, we find names of 14 men and probably one woman who mm -hmm. is uh, uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai. And we see mm -hmm. how we denote, denote her as a warrior who fought like a man, mm -hmm. even in our literature. Like in a reference, uh, we you know, we have all heard the poem, um, So, uh, do you think that when we are talking about people in our history, we somewhere tend to subvert the female consciousness there? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think we tend to suppress the female consciousness, tend to the, the, histo the historians who are writing the conventional histories, 
you know, which which are really mainstream is actually male stream. You know, the mainstream is very male stream. So these histories have colluded with uh, such uh, such kinds of constructions and. Uh, so putting um, different standards for women based on the canonical kind of standard being the men and of course the more powerful men also so but but different categories of men are the standard so it could be warrior men it could be kings it could be male writers uh, the standards are set by them so women's or uh, consciousness is very much ignored suppressed misunderstood are simply, you know, made invisible. And uh, uh, women characters kind of, uh, when you start looking, they're emerging from kind of nooks and crannies, you know. And each one is laboring against this kind of grain of patriarchy in some or the other aspect of her life, because otherwise she wouldn't have survived and contributed what she did. So, uh, so, so in a way, you know, ordinary and extraordinary women are are all laboring against the grain of patriarchy. You know, they're we're all against the current, and uh, living against the current, surviving, working, thinking. So, uh, so the public sphere has been reserved for men, and women assigned subsidiary roles in the private domain. Uh, as as um, stereotypical daughters, history has kind of colluded with this natural history, sociology, naturalizing women as stereotypical daughters, wives, mothers, um, uh, symbols of domesticity, one would say, rather than active human beings. So uh, when we look at the hidden agency of these oppressed, no, their consciousness, we find not only subjugation or victimhood, but also protest. So much creativity, so much resistance, so much achievement. It's quite astonishing sometimes because they were, you know, so much against the current. So, but um, uh, women became and have been thinkers and doers and movers and shakers, and um, challenging hierarchies. Sometimes bringing peace out of chaos, surviving despite routine devaluation making multifaceted contributions so they so they actually so when we start writing and looking we reinterpret you know for instance um, if a queen such as Dida or Bezabai that's another uh, woman from central India who was a queen and uh, Gwalior so after years of experience as regent they were each of them uh, Dida of Kashmir Bezabai of Gwalior for many years, they were regent, um, uh, which means that the uh, king was actually uh, young, minor. So they were reigning until he became major. So if they did not really want to hand over to a raw young man uh, who could be her son or grandson, um, isn't that a just claim? Isn't there justice in that? These were both very good rulers. And there's, uh, you know, people, historians have said that. So that, we can, I mean, I'm not saying all women are great rulers, but here we have historians who are conventional historians saying that they were, like I just read out about Dinda. Uh, so um, the, the person who has the right to be king, it is only by virtue of gender, simply because he's a man, he's just 18, he knows nothing about ruling, about statesmanship, but she does. She's been doing it. She's been doing it very well. However, the conventional historians will call her um, such a woman over ambitious, lusting for power and so on. And jump to the kind of conclusion, as I said, that, for instance, Dida murdered her son or grandson to remain in power, where there's no evidence for that. So, um, you know, to, to look at the, some of the whole gamut of it, um, we have Sulabha, the philosopher from ancient India, who ought to be far better known. Uh, there's an open debate with King Janak, who accepts defeat. She wanders all over, uh, seeking scholarly discussion. She is single because no husband could be found worthy of her. And the Sulabha-Janak dialogue is there in the Shanti Parv of the Mahabharata. But it has been ignored by and large by the conventional scholars. So it's like a you know blindness, a patriarchal blindness. You just don't look at um, where there is evidence of women's agency and brilliance, 
and uh, similarly with local mudra that um, yeah, you know there, there's a uh, verses in the rigveda loka mudra with her husband agastya whom we know much better sage agastya but loka mudra actually wins that that that, that discussion it's kind of a, a synoptic uh, longer dialogue between them she teaches him that a spiritual life need not be purely ascetic it can be coterminous with joyous worldly life then this khana the bengali astronomer she was an astronomer scientist people scientist um, people's architect she had so much wisdom which is still you know quoted her sayings are still quoted in bengali homes very simple very wise pithy sayings no khana's tongue was perhaps cut off because she was more capable in her work than the male astronomers of the time including her father in law varaha mira now this is a lot of legend out here we don't know her exact years but this is popular history popular passed down in some way and um, we don't know but in bengal khana is well known there have been two tv serials made on her her books are available khana sings so these were real women who had made an impact on society um i probably just say one or two more of the women who who their consciousness you know really needs to be looked at and so uh, devi vidisha she was a buddhist she was ashok king ashok's first wife now she lived on in vidisha when ashok went back to patliputra and became king their daughter was sanghamitra sanghamitra too turned to buddhism and this is all much before ashoka became buddhist but look at the influences upon him of his first wife his daughter becomes buddhist and later ashoka turns to buddhism and um, the faith that he was introduced to by devi vidisha his first wife and as we know sanghamitra became an ambassador you know taking buddhism with her to sri lanka she lived there at she was in her early 30s when she went and she lived the rest of her life there up to the age of 80 she is highly venerated in sri lanka as well as southeast asian communities several countries so um uh, should should i should i go on for another 2 minutes on this or would you like yes yeah, sure um actually i uh, something is related to this this question yeah. uh, yeah. that um you know uh, the other names if we find if you are determined to find other women in the history which are yeah. you know easily available it can be mirabai razia sultan mm. all from a very privileged background but yeah. your book i like you were speaking that mm, a lot of women like ovia nangeli khona mm. and many more who are actually subaltern women uh, mm. so was this intentional to include these stories about women who came from less yeah. privileged backgrounds yeah yeah um hemanti you know it's absolutely definitely intentional to be inclusive to include women from different backgrounds different uh, regions different uh, class and caste backgrounds different uh, you know areas that they worked in i did want it to be the selection was not easy i mean these are not the only women that one could have written about so um one major criteria was uh, diversity and inclusiveness and um, it's true that there is more material on the elite women so yes i had to research a little more for the dalit women and but uh, intersectionality is intrinsic to my politics and my thinking and it's intrinsic to this book uh, i mean it is definitely not at all about only elite women um, even the elite women are largely the ones who are here are here because they are rebels of some kind but um, uh we writing a more complete and balanced history requires as much attention if not more to the subaltern women and um they, you know there's no rescue operation we're doing here because their lives are of the greatest interest they are not predictable or stereotypical characters at all either so you you know nangeli you mentioned no nangeli uh in kerala she protested against the moola karam that is the breast tax in travancore so there was a tax on women who were of a certain caste um uh, it was called a breast tax and it had to be paid 
there was, of course, a great deal of um, protest and stirring about it, but it was also a situation where they were the poor and they were just laboring, so they would just pay, you know, in rice, actually. So, so the, when the person came to collect the um, tax for that month, um, what what Nangali did, because she had just had enough, she was extremely furious, and she had taken a decision. She was alone at home at that point. She had decided what she would do and prepared for it. She actually, so, you know, the rice would be offered, given on a banana leaf as tax. Um, what she did was she cut off her own breast and put it on the banana leaf and gave it to the official. It, it was spouting with blood and she died um, as she gave this tax. But I would imagine that she knew her sacrifice was not in vain when she saw the look on that man's face. And in fact, Nangeli's protest sent shockwaves throughout the state. The next day, the king is issued a proclamation revoking Mulakaram, fearing an agitation. Of course, it didn't completely die out. There's a long history of that tax. But, uh, but to quickly say that the other Dalit women, like Rami, a washerwoman, she's a poet, uh, she, she's a Bhakti movement poet, Janabai, the well known Maharashtrian um, uh, poet saint, Jana, Janabai was a servant bonded to a particular household. But she infused her work with dignity and power, kind of creatively subverting the social order. Her devotional poetry is still sung by devotees. And her work challenges prejudices of caste and gender, profound critique of conventional morality and society, uh, of gender and caste. She wrote, let me not be sad because I am born a woman. In this world, many saints suffer the same way. She wrote, as she was cleaning floors and carrying garbage, she wrote, Jani sweeps the floor. The Lord collects the dirt. Jani says, O Gopala, help celebrate the festival of powerlessness. So there were other Dalit women saints like Kanhopatra, and I have Kanhopatra's story. From the Buddha's time, we have others like this, you know, who came from very working class and backgrounds like Punna, was a slave and because of her wisdom her master freed her there was obava known as onake obava because she died guarding the fort of chitradurga she celebrated for her courage and heroism in karnataka and to finally say that when we look at lakshmi bai whom you you know mentioned as the very best known really of women uh, but this Jhalkari Bai, who fought along with her, a lower caste, a Kohli, a weaver woman, and she fought in the Durga Dal, and she substituted for Lakshmi Bai to fool the British and allow Rani Lakshmi Bai to escape from the Jhansi fort. Similarly, with Hazrat Begum in Lucknow, there's a woman called Uda Pasi, who was one of the Dalit women, but we have her name at least. She was a sharpshooter. She killed several of the enemy the, uh, from her perch high in a tree. She was killed fighting. So we have many others. We have the Devadasi, Molla, the Tavai of Chandabai Mahalaka, Mudupalani, Amrapali, we know, Ambapali or Amrapali. These were actually composers and creators of culture. Uh, they were Tavayas or Devdasis at the margins of so-called respectable society. But they had actually a niche in society, and somewhere the historians have actually not even done justice to the place that they occupied in their time. The last story that I have, you know, is of Savitri by Pule and her companions, that was Fatima Sheikh, the Tarabai Shinde, Mukta Salvi, now um, Sagunabai. Now, this was uh, Mahar Mang Mukta Salve, was just a 15-year-old girl who wrote a text called Stri Purush Tulna at that time, you know, 19th, mid-19th century. And a 15-year-old Dalit girl, we know nothing about her except this text. We, we don't know anything after her, uh, what happened to her after she wrote this. But, I mean, we know that this text was really appreciated. She read it out. The, um, and so on. But after that, what happened to her, we don't know. She vanishes. 
Um, but she's often dubbed as um, the first feminist writer, and she's often this text is often dubbed as the first feminist text written in contemporary India. It's a sharp critique of Brahmanism and patriarchy. So, so it's you know I just say here that it's the caste, but also the religion that I was looking at, religion caste. So, so this figure Pulle is also Fatima Sheikh with her, and very very important people. Yeah, I know there's not much time, Himanti. Yeah. yeah. So um, one more very important question is that uh, you have also been a part of academics. So I uh, wanted to ask you this particular question that uh, you have talked about all the women uh, who are, in your words, in being thinkers, doers, movers, and shakers. You know. So um, how do you think? including these really powerful women in our curriculum will affect the patriarchal narrative of history. Yeah, I mean, it's just of the greatest importance to include such stories because textbooks um, and other supplementary readings at school level and even other higher education levels, people should be reading this. And I would say even popular media should have the stories with the proper kind of, you know, perspective. For instance, you have Razia, and she's again with that Altunia and Yakub and all. She's portrayed as completely, you know, a love lawn, this, that um, yes. heroine, whereas she was this amazingly powerful ruler. So there's so much history, which is actually more interesting, more dramatic, not so stereotypical, sickly, sentimental as what um, the media sometimes does to, to, to real people. So we need textbooks. And we need media that is able to overcome the patriarchal and misogynist biases and is more balanced. So um, we need uh, this so that young people will have the real picture, you know, a more full picture, a more diverse picture, a full picture where there is the women and the men and the children and um, a picture that is not full of patriarchal prejudices. So, this is so important because it is also providing ways of looking at the present and of shaping the future. Yeah. Okay. Then we come to the last question uh, yeah. for the evening. Uh, yeah. How was your publishing journey with Rupa Publications? And how was yeah, the editorial yeah. experience? What value did such intervention add to your work? Yeah. So I have to thank um, Rupa because um, were it not for Rupa Publishers, uh, this book would perhaps never have been written, you know, because although, as I said, I did have the idea and the motivation inside me for many years, but it was such a daunting task, you know, to even select which women. It's a huge challenge, and I may not have taken it up on my own, or I may have kept postponing it if um, Rupa were not there, and Rupa being there, it was Rupa that took the initiative. Um, I didn't know them. They didn't know me personally. But probably the commissioning editor had read some of my earlier work uh, because uh, they actually approached me to do this book. And um, they, they, they were thinking, I think, of queens and so on. But um, they were very, very open to it being a very diverse set of women. And um, of course, it took much longer than we had assumed earlier. But they, they understood. So I have to thank them for, you know, I have to give them their due for that, that uh, they didn't try to push me, they didn't try to say that, okay, why is it not there or give up on me. So they gave me the courage to take up the task. And it's very helpful if one has a supportive publisher. They also hung in with me when they found that I'm, I'm you know, working at it. And even the writing up took, you know, long. It was, each story was written up several times. It's not easy. It's pretty tricky to write up. You know, so I mean, sometimes I had to clip and edit at a lot of material on somebody. Sometimes I had to flesh out the scrap I had. So, um, I, 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 you know, finally I'd say that it was great that Rupa brought it out on a very good, symbolically just right day, that is 8th of March. And um, also that Rupa is connecting me to book lovers and to book events and to these wonderful initiatives such as yours. Thank you, Deepti Ma'am, for the very insightful conversation and your time this evening. Thank you so much, Hemanti. Thank you.
it was very very nice to uh, be with you yeah here, ma'am. i would like to remind that tell me your story dot biz calls for registration for the writing program season 6 in association with rupa publications to participate in this writing workshop you must register by 15th of may write read share till then stay well stay safe happy reading and happy writing good night <laughs>